Isaac was the man's name. Rebecca was the woman's name. Rebecca was near, uh, his Isaac was 40 when he got married. Rebecca, he's nearly 60 now, and was crying because he didn't have any children. God heard her prayer, and she had twins. They struggled within her, and she prayed, and God gave her two nations in her womb. The Lord told her, He said, the elder will serve the younger. And as you know the story, Esau was the first. His old red-headed, freckled boy had old red hairs all over his arms. But Esau, or Jacob, his brother, was smooth skin. And that's where he tell them apart. And Jacob hung around the tent with his mama. Esau went out and hunted. His daddy was old man. His daddy wanted the, the, the deer meat. He went out and cut the meat. And he slipped it in on his daddy and, you know, stole his brother's birthright. You know the story. Now, the birthright in Old Testament times meant three things. I've had people ask me, what exactly is the birthright? Well, it meant three things in the Old Testament. Number one, it meant that the, whoever had the birthright would succeed the father as the head of the family and inherit a double portion of the property that the dad would leave. Number two, it meant that he would exercise the right of being the priest in that family. For as you know in, in this story in Genesis, there was no such thing as an established priesthood. It didn't come until the time of, of Exodus and Moses. So the man who had the birthright was the heavenly priest interceding to God for that family. Number three, it meant that that man would be blessed in the messianic prophetic line which run Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau got left out because Esau sold his birthright and been in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to have the birthright in the book of Genesis was a tremendous, tremendous advantage. It was a spiritual thing, but Esau sold his spiritual inheritance for a physical thrill. Did you hear me? I said Esau sold his spiritual inheritance for a physical thrill. The millions and millions of people who are doing this in America today is absolutely too many to number. People who are selling their spiritual heritage for a physical thrill. Many who are should be in church this morning saying I'm preparing myself for a mansion in the sky are laying at home with a hangover this morning feeding their flesh and giving their flesh a temporary thrill. You can go out and give your flesh a temporary thrill and you can live it up and get high and have all the fun you want to have, but the day will come when you will live to regret that sin. I'll guarantee it. I'll guarantee you that. He had an opportunity to get right. He had an opportunity to be saved. God writes opportunity on one side of that door. And he writes responsibility on the other side of that door. God gives you an opportunity to come this morning and get your life right with God. But with that opportunity comes a terrible responsibility. And you are responsible to God. You and girls, hear me this morning. Some of you that are only 10, 11, 12 years old. You think, well, I'm just a young kid. My mom and daddy have to worry about me. You are responsible to God for getting your life right with Him. You're responsible. There is a responsibility. In the New Testament, there are 260 chapters. From Matthew to Revelation, 260 chapters. In those 260 chapters, there are 234 warnings for you to get your life right with God. Now, if you went on a trip for 260 miles, let's say you left from here. Get me up on this one, Brother Roy. This one right here. Let's say you left from here and you was going towards Atlanta. And you were going to drive uh, 40 miles past Atlanta. That'd be about 260 miles. And you drove 260 miles just straight on the interstate. And out of 260 miles, you saw 234 signs warning you of something. If you saw 234 signs in 200, that's almost a mile. You ever been going down the interstate 95? And it'll say, Starving Marvins. And you go a little bit further, and they'll say, Starving Marvins. And you, listen, I don't know who Starving Marvin is, and I don't, but, but by the time I seen so many of them things, I wanted to stop. 
I thought, well, he must be pure. All these signs, you see what it says, Stuckey's, eight miles, Stuckey's, five miles, Stuckey's, three miles, Stuckey's, 99 cent breakfast, two eggs, you know, bacon, uh, uh, coffee, 99 cents. I got to where I wanted breakfast. I wasn't even hungry. I seen all them sea signs. Now if, if you went on a trip, that trip was 260 miles, you saw 234 signs and 260 miles, and the bridge was out and you ran off in the hole, who are you going to blame? Or are you going to say, well, I didn't know it was... God gave you a Bible! 260 chapters in that New Testament. 234 times. He said, get right, get right, get right, get right. You'll live to regret it if you don't. I'll guarantee you, you'll live to regret it. I'm prophesying. You'll live to regret it. You'll live to regret that day if you don't get your life right with God. Opportunity knocks. But if you don't respond, your opportunity will be gone. I heard about this fellow who had a lot of money and he's really wanting some cars. And he walked into a car dealership and he said... I want to buy a six new cars. And the guy said, oh, get out of here, man. We ain't got time to fool with jokers like you. And he did. Walked right out of the door, walked across the street to another car dealer and bought 16 cars. And the guy said, oh, man, I didn't know he really meant it. See, he had his chance and he blew it. There, there comes a time when your chances are no more. There comes a time when you look back and say, oh, no, what in the world have I done? There comes a time when it is too late. I was thinking about our nation this morning and last night. I was studying and praying. And I was thinking about uh, something that I read. And I, I want to give it to you. They said when... Archaeologists and geologists and all them people, they begin to dig and study remains of ancient civilizations. And they cover, uncovered the ruins of Pompeii. And in the ruins of Pompeii, they said that they uncovered uh, things like images and stuff to let us know that vileness and sin was rampant in the city of Pompeii and that there was p pornography and that type of sin all over the country. And they uncovered it, and they worshipped many gods, and especially the God of obscenity. I believe this morning, I believe the Lord's coming soon, but if I, I believe if Jesus wasn't coming, some future generation would dig up the remains of America. And brother, they'd say, this is that great nation that used to be the greatest nation on earth, that used to be the most powerful military threat, that used to be a Christian nation, and the remains of this nation is nothing but obscene material, pornography, wickedness, filth, liquor bottles, all kinds of sin. America is headed for doomsday just as sure as we're here this morning. It's only going to be a matter of time. Our society this morning is headed in the steps of ancient Rome and ancient Rome fell because they had too much money and too much free time and too much leisure and no moral standards. It didn't matter if you was married or not. You could shack up, go to bed with a different person every weekend. Nobody thought nothing about it, about it. And Rome fell. And there ain't never been a society that stood yet who's living like America is living today. Did y'all hear me? You say, oh well, something will work out. No, it won't. God is not mocked. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God, our nations forgot God this morning. Lord, it's scary. It's scary. Up in Louisville, while I was preaching this week, the preacher got me down there. I began to talk to him. You know, I was doing the uh, special presentation on rock and roll on Friday, Friday, Thursday, uh, Thursday night. And the preacher told me, he said, we have a satanic church in this town. He said, they got a big building to run 400 every Sunday morning. He said, everybody knows it. Nobody, nothing hid. He said, you see them a lot of time. We saw some in a restaurant not long ago. And he said, they all come in dressed from black, or with black from head to toe. And he said, the whole time they were eating, we had a little girl with us about four years old, and they stared at that little girl. And he said, this is a common thing. He said, it's a cup. Listen, you're at Appalachian State University, and what they're selling through bending machines and now trying to put it on the other college campuses in North Carolina? Have you heard about what's going on? Listen, have you heard about that prime time television is beginning to... Act? Listen, there's some of the moo critics that have quit their job 
because they can't keep a clean life and review the movies on primetime TV that they're supposed to be critics of. And the decent ones are quitting, which leads indecent ones to judge, and they start to compete with cable, and to compete with HBO, and to compete with video movies, that primetime CBS, NBC, and ABC is going to unleash a flood of filth on us. Lesbianism, uh, homosexuality, the old boys and girls learning to be homosexuals while they're little. And of course, you know, it's going to move into it gradually. You know, where somebody at school shacks up with their teacher and stuff like that. And all kinds of situations that are anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-church and at the same time at the same time ladies and gentlemen in Omaha a fifth grader after his school work was done pulls his Bible out from under his desk and begins to read it and is ordered and forbidden to stop reading his Bible at the same time, at the same time, a fifth grade teacher in another state is now suing the school system because the fifth grade teacher, you know like when a teacher gives, has a few minutes of rest there while the kids are taking a test or something, man was reading his Bible. And the principal said you to quit reading the Bible. He wasn't teaching it. He wasn't endorsing it. He wasn't having pride. He just pulled that book out and read it. There is an anti-God, anti-Bible movement of spirit sweeping across this nation like we have never seen before. And so you think it's been bad for us in the last year. There's no telling what we're going to see from here on in. But we're living in a cesspool of iniquity. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Did you kids up north in schools, can, can they can't have their ears pierced without their parents' written consent, but can go have an abortion and the school approves of it and don't even have to tell their mom and daddy. We're going to live to regret the way we're living in this nation. The United Church of Canada, the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, just passed a resolution which permits homosexuals to become ministers in their 800,000 member denomination. Let me prophesy, the church of Canada will live to regret that. They'll live to regret it. In the Methodist church, many councils are saying, we've got to get these old songs about the blood like we've seen up here a while ago. They say that doesn't fit in our generation. It's a bloody religion. It doesn't, it doesn't fit our society. God is love. God is sweet. God is nice. God is wonderful. Smile, you know, and all this kind of stuff. The church, uh, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Baptist church, and anyone who partakes in removing the, the hymnal, the songs about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ will live to regret that. I'm telling you this, the song's still true. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white. Is that stuff out there on the ground that fell last week? No, I found out. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't know what kind of secret they've found, but I know when I get dirty and I have sin in my heart and I feel like a low-down dog, I know there's only one thing can help me. I crawl up under Calvary once again and say, Dear God, help me on me. And there's something about believing in that blood that'll take your guilty soul and make it feel good and clean again. Them people might be good enough where they don't need the blood, but son, don't take it out of my books. I'd be in bad shape without it. I'll guarantee you I'd be embarrassed without it. America will live to regret how we're doing. I'll guarantee it. America will live to regret. Perfect illustration of this, and I'm going to give you this this morning before I close. Everybody, I guess, has been following the news media and the story of Ted Bundy. One of the most unusual stories that's hit the hit the paper, really, and the news media in our generation. Ted Bundy was just executed in Florida in the electric chair just a few weeks ago. 
I don't know, two or three weeks ago. And I guess all of y'all have heard all the controversy and the, and the things surrounding his death and the people were protesting against the death penalty. I'm not here to preach on this this morning, but just let me give you two reasons why the death penalty must be and has to be enforced. That might blow some of you's mind. Oh no, a preacher that believes in the death penalty, a preacher that does not even the death penalty does not believe his Bible. Are you hearing me? There's two reasons why the death penalty... You say, well, that might happen to one of your kids one day. That's right, it might. You say, that might happen to you. That's right, it might. But that can't change what God said in the Bible. There's two reasons why we must have the death penalty. Number one is because God instituted it in the Old Testament. He said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. I can't help it. I didn't write the Bible. If you don't like it, you tell him what you don't like what he put in there. Tell him. See if it does you any good. I'm just telling you what it says. Well, I don't like Danny Castle. You have to get in line. i got people ahead of you. You're narrow-minded what you are. Listen. The second reason is, is to stop crime. You know what they done in China? They took, and I'm not saying we should do this here, I just wouldn't be a bad idea. They took drug pushers. And they said, if you're caught selling drugs, first offense, you're on drugs, we're going to put you in a place, and we're going to give you a chance to get straightened out, and then you're going to become a respectable member of society. The second time, shoot you. Amen. And did you know that China does not have a drug problem? They don't have one. Hey man, these people out here ain't stupid. They know. Listen, half them guys are homosexual anyway. Sending them to prison ain't hurt them. That's free room and board, all the lovers you want, pool tables, color TV, air conditioned building. What prison gonna do to anybody? Boy, I'm hitting some snags right there. Mm, old brother Danny has done quit preaching and gone to meddling. I have the worst habit of that. <laughs> I'm telling you, brother, listen, hey, if you knew if you got caught selling dope that's going to shoot you, you'd think twice before you'd do it. Wouldn't you? I would, brother. No way, man. I'll go get me a decent job and make me an honest living. Now, you say, well, that sounds cruel. But see, what you're doing is, when, when, a, when a person is executed by the state... That is not murder. He is the minister of God avenging on such. That is not murder. Don't give me that thou shalt not kill business. You don't understand what you're talking about. That is an execution of the state. And brother, you know what that'll do? That'll make some other pervert. You say, well, Bundy, it's terrible that they put him to death. And, and I hate it happened for the guy. But how do you think that little 12-year-old girl felt? That he drugged down there in Lakeland, Florida and put her in a pig sty and mutilated her and let her blood run out of her. Did she have any rights? How do you think those other 29 women felt? Who were dragged from cars, who were dragged and tortured and split with knives and raped and humiliated and abused and screamed while their blood run men to satisfy his lust. How many nights did they have? How many appeals did they get to make? Amen! We got a warped society, man. We got the hero being the criminal and the poor innocent victim being the bad guy. I'm telling you this morning, how many times have I told you all this? Don't ever forget, the way you know the devil's in something, it goes backwards. It goes backwards. Our society thinks backwards nowadays. It thinks backwards nowadays. They think all preachers are crooks and all perverts are nice people who are liber liberated and have a right to do as they please. I'm telling you this morning, Ladies and gentlemen, that man, they said he started off drug killing. They said he may have killed as many as 50. He did confess to 30 or 20. And they, they tried to, maybe even more than 50 that they said. Florida law enforcement said that 9 out of 10 murders are caused 
by uh, those sex murders are caused by the viewers viewing pornography. Did you hear me? They, they say that nine out of ten involve it almost in every case. And one the skeptics say that that it didn't have anything to do with it. But let me tell you what sin does. Let me tell you what you boys here. If there's any boys here this morning uh, sneaking around getting dirty books, uh, looking at them dirty books, you boys look up here a minute. You hear me? Listen, little squirt. You better come up here and ask God to forgive you and get that junk out of your head or one day you're out to find yourself strapped in an electric chair somewhere and brother wishing to God you'd never been born. You'll live to regret it! Ted Bundy did. The police said he was amazing. They said he had he was cocky. He was arrogant. They'd talk about his victims in the courtroom and he'd laugh and stroke his hair in front of the camera. And he had women writing him even up until the end as pit pals. Dumb women if I've ever heard of them. You better write him, man. You better not date him. He'll like to kill you with a letter. Let me tell you what sin is. One thing leads to another. Sin thrills and then it kills. Sin fascinates and then it assassinates. You can't beat God. Eleven years it took the court system to get him. Eleven years. Time magazine wrote this. In the afternoon, kids turn on TV soap operas. This is Time magazine. And see adults drinking to feel comfortable, using drugs for fun, having sex with each other's mates. Or on TV talk shows, they hear adults sometimes brag about similar behavior. Self-restraint seems no longer a very adult way to act. But the night before, the night before, Mr. Bundy, and I hope and pray to God that he was saved. Dr. Dobson, you know, got to talk to him and have his last interview with him, James Dobson, and of course... He probably couldn't have had a, made a better choice than calling Dr. Dobson at a time like that. And the night before he was saved, he started confessing. How serious, or the night before he died. And he started confessing and he told about that little 12 year old girl that he took down there in Florida and murdered her and mutilated her and then left her in a pigsty. And they finally started showing remorse. And he began to talk. And you know what he said? He said, it goes back to when I was 12 years old. His granddaddy was a reader of pornography. And he would sneak in his granddad's room and get his dirty books and look at the pictures. And Ted Bundy, 42 years old, 30 years later, mine went back to when he was 12 years old. He lived to regret it. He lived to regret it. I don't glory in the fact of his death. I don't get some kind of sadistic thrill out of it. It doesn't make me happy. It has to be done, but I don't glory in it. And the only reason I'd bring it up this morning is not to be gory or gross, but to try to show you young people in here this morning, you can fool around with little sins when you're 12 and 13 years old. Hey, you can't see what's going on when you're 30 and 35 and 40 years old. You'll live to regret it. Now see, if Bundy, if Ted Bundy had been 13 years old and sitting in this church this morning and I preached this same message, he might could have got out of his seat. And come down to the altar and say, God, I don't want my life to go that way. He said, oh, I'm not going to wind up and all that. He didn't know he was either. You don't think it, see? Sin thrills, then it kills. It tickleth while it stabbeth. It tastes good going down. You don't get the poison until it's too late for you to get rid of it. Ted Bundy could come down here if he was 14 or 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 19 and say, God, if he'd have done that, who knows? He might have been a priest right now. He might have been happily married right now with kids and seeing his kids, boys and girls grow up. 
But Ted Bundy lived to regret. And you will too. See, right now you're in your sin. You think, well, Brother Danny, I know what you're saying is right and I know it's true, but I just don't know if I can quit. No, you can't uh, by yourself. You can't by yourself. You've got to beg God to have mercy on you and help you and then stick with Christian people. See, you're going to be like whoever you run around with. Whoever you run around with, you're going to be like them. You hear me? What you need to do is get your life right with God and then get with the right crowd. We say the right crowd ain't popular. Okay, make up your mind. You can't have it all. You can't have it all. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. While they come and get us a song, the thought of the message, you'll live to regret it. I hope and pray to God that you'll settle it with the Lord this morning. God wants to do something for you. Don't, you don't want to wind up, Lord, help. You don't want to wind up like Ted Bundy. Surely, goodness, you don't. You say, I ain't going to electric chair. You might not, but God, you see, something else is going to get you. Something else is going to get you. Would you be willing this morning to say, all right, preacher, I'm ready to settle this thing. I'm ready to get rid of this life that I've been living. I'm ready to get my act together. If God will help me, I'm going to come to that altar. Now, I'm going to ask you a question this morning before we, before we pray. If there's somebody here this morning that you've really got a burden for, and they're here this morning and you know that things ain't right in their life, I want to ask you, if, if you want to, feel like the Lord let you, I want you to just come to the altar right now and pray for them. Just get out of your seat and come up here and pray for them right now. If there's somebody that you know is here, not, not, not ashamed to do it, and you just want to come to the altar and pray for them right now. Amen. That's right. That's right. Now, folks, Ted Bundy didn't have the opportunity. You've got some of you. You've got an opportunity to get right this morning. You've got an opportunity to get right. Some are already coming. If God is dealing with you, why don't you get your life right this morning? Dear God, do something this morning. Deliver somebody. Deliver somebody that needs it so bad. They can't do it by themselves. They've tried and failed. We can't do it, God. We've tried and failed. I pray you would do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank God. That's right. Amen. Some of you ladies come and pray with with these girls over here that need somebody to pray with them. Let's sing, Brother John. Why sing? Won't you come? Just get out of your seat this morning. Let's do business with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Just get out of your seat and let's do business with God this morning. The preaching of the Word of God is what will keep you on track. Keep you straight. Keep you living right. Would you come? Would you come right now? Come on. Would you come right now? You got a problem? You got something you need to get straight? You come on right now. Why we pray? Help me. Why we say? Help me. Help me. Don't wind up right telling you did. My soul, man. My soul. Let's get it settled this morning. Sing it, brother. Why we sing? Why we sing? Won't you come? Why we sing? Won't you come? Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let God help you this morning. Amen. Let the Lord help you this morning. Forgiven. I want all y'all to tell her, just stay up here for a minute. Just stay up here. I want to sing another verse, and every one of you, if you will, just stay up here for a minute. I'm going to pray with you before we let you go. We're going to sing one more verse this morning. If God's dealing with your heart and you need to come, hey, there's some people up here who need some help, folks. There's some people up here who go one direction or the other. That's what I, we're in business here at this church. We are in business to try to head you off and head you in another direction toward God. Let's, let's sing one more verse, Brother John. I was saying, would you come? Would you come right now? Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 Y'all just stay up here. I'm going to pray with you before you go. Amen. 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 
Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Somebody else. Somebody else. Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. Amen. Thank the Lord. If you need to come, come on right now. Amen. All right, just bow your heads with us. Bow your head and close your eyes. Everyone bow. Sins, that he's to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you confessed it to God? You gotta confess it now. Confess it to God. You say, well, Brother Danny, I know it's wrong. Yeah, but you tell God that you confessed it. God, I'm guilty. God, this is wrong. Lord, it, it's, it can't have dominion over me no more. I'm confessing my sin. Do that right now. Now, you turn from that sin. Lord, by your grace, I'm turning. I'm not going to let it ruin me. By your grace and help, I, my life's going to be different. I don't want to look back and live to regret my life. I don't want to live to regret it. God, I want to look back and be satisfied and be happy. One of these days, friend, if you don't get right, you'll live to regret the way you're living. You'll live to regret it. And see, then it's too late. You can't go back and change it. After it's done, you can't go back and change it. So why not settle it this morning? Tell God from the bottom of your heart, Lord, it's different. Our society is eat up with it. It's full of filth. And it takes some effort to keep your head above water. You gotta pray. You gotta meditate. You don't have to you don't have to dog paddle, man. Stay up in our generation. It's filthy. It's filthy. May God help you to make that step before it's too late. Dear God, I, help, I pray you help these on the altar. Lord, some of them are carrying a heavy load. Dear God in heaven, dear God in heaven, do a miracle in their life right now. Lord, there are others, no doubt, that are here this morning who a dagger of conviction is stuck in their soul. And they're not going to be happy. They're going to be miserable. The next time they go out to sin, Lord, they're going to be miserable. Please, God, don't let them blow it. Lord, they'll live to regret it. Please help them to realize the wages of sin is death. Nobody could tell us that probably any more than Ted Bundy right now if he could talk. The wages of sin is death. But dear God, I know he's gone and he's had his chance. And he's gone to meet the judge now that he can't con and can't bribe and can't lie to. Oh God, have mercy on the rest of us that we live our life right. And especially these on the altar that's been on the altar this morning. Give them new grace. Give them new determination. Give them new courage to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.